And we're live. So welcome everybody to this remote interview. My name is Lisette and I'm interviewing people and companies doing great things remotely. And today on the line, all the way from Rochester, New York in the US, I have Cassie Labori. Cassie, you are a virtual learning expert specializing in developing trainers and virtual classroom strategies. You are also the author of a book recently published called Interact and Engage, 75 plus activities for virtual training, meetings, and webinars. When I saw that, I just had to talk to you. I was like right up my alley. This is so awesome. So Cassie, welcome so much. I'm uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. It's exciting to be talking about this topic in particular. I obviously love it. Right. And a really important topic, especially for this day, because everybody's tired of boring webinars. We can do so much better in these virtual walls, and we're going to get to that. But first, let's start with the first question, which is, what does your virtual office look like? And what do you need in order to get your work done? Oh, my gosh. Well, first off, I am a collector of things from yesteryear. And so something that makes me very happy, if uh, you're looking at the video, you can see that I've got some very colorful vintage Viking uh, vases behind me that are from the 1960s. And then that wall unit is as well, so is the chair. And so for, for me, it has to have like a look and feel. And uh, what you don't see on the camera, but what I see all the time and I, I look over to my right and see is I have a, quite a large collection of vintage Barbie. And so she becomes essentially my audience. And all of them are over there smiling at me dressed in their various outfits for the season and all those things. Uh, so those are the things that are important for me uh, as a creative person, uh, but I also have, you know, microphones, ring lights, a very comfortable chair. My chair is pink <laughs> and I have uh, various computers. I always teach from several computers. I have several monitors. Uh, so, you know, there's all those things around me too. The, the water, uh, ways to take notes. I have actually many places to take notes that are handwritten, but I also recently got a remarkable so I can maybe not pile up as much paper. And I take notes that way too, although I'm finding I'm just doing both. <laughs> and I also have uh, things like uh, my cell phone as backup and then other little things like snacks and lotions and lipsticks in the drawers around me. So I love Boy, it. I gave you everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's really paints a beautiful picture. And what I'm wondering is, have you ever worked in an office before? Like in an, all right. What I did the actually, office environment look like for you? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, it's the same. I have worked in uh, several different offices and even though I was doing a remote job and the irony, uh, it was the late nineties when I began working for WebEx, but I worked in the office at WebEx. So we were all required to be in the office, even though we were the ones that were saying, hey, you don't have to be in an office, um, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> uh, but I always have things around me uh, that that uh, that would demonstrate or at least fill, sort of fill my, you know, energy with the creative thing. So there's colorful vintage things around me um, because there's something about uh, the space looking like the way I want it to look so that I could then feel as I need to feel and then be able to convey and present and speak in front of an audience in a way that's true to me. I love that. I love that. And I know that our um, environments, for some people, it is more inspiring or motivating than for others. And I'm one of those people where uh, beautiful things is also very motivating for me. Like I really need that. And so I asked you only because I had the experience of working in the office and I just found it like dull and gray and it was the same every day. And it was just, I had to bring in plants to make it. Do the same. And it, yeah. And yeah. it didn't like occur to me until much in later. Cubicles. Yes. And in WebEx, we were in cubicles. And so, you know, we would try to decorate our cubicles as best we could. Uh, and then when I worked at Dale Carnegie, I had an office with a door. And so I could decorate it a little differently and hang things on the walls. And, you know, I used to bring things that were not from the office supplies, but rather from my own home <laughs> to, to put my office together. Right, right. Love it. I think that's one of the big benefits of being able to design our own workspaces in order to enhance our own productivity and our own processes. So love that. Love that. All right. Well, let's, uh, I've got a number of things. So you have written, you are a virtual learning expert and specializing in sort of online 
presentations and meeting facilitation, trainings, webinars. And I would love to get into some tips for each of those, because as we know, we're all done with the boring webinar. So there must be something we can do. What do trainers and facilitators get wrong most often when they present online? Oh my gosh. Well, first off, most trainers and facilitators today are so much better than they've ever been. So Good point. To, I just want to start off by saying, pat yourselves on the back <laughs> because you're doing great. Uh, but I think that what we all get wrong, what we can get wrong, and wrong is such a hard word, isn't it? But what we can mistake, you know, make a mistake about is thinking that the audience cares about us. <laughs> like that the, the, it's really important to remember that your audience cares most about themselves and what they need from the time spent there with you. Uh, they don't care so much about you rambling on. They care more about you once you demonstrate to them that you care for them. It's, it's a classic Dale Carnegie principle to, you know, you can influence others more by asking them questions and inquiring with how they are than standing there and saying, this is the world according to me and here's my story and what I think you should do. You know, people just do not respond to that, especially initially. You know, they respond more when they recognize you care and you're there to provide them with something that's going to make a difference in their lives. Right. I love it. It makes me think back to Zig Ziglar, who was sort of a famous salesperson, right? He always said, listen to WIIFM radio. What's in it for them radio? I, you see a lot of advertisement out there that says, join my webinar. And Zig Ziglar always points out, like, nobody cares about your webinar. They care about what do they get when right. they join your webinar. And so this is the same thing. So don't worry so much about you worry about what is the value you're trying to give to your audience in the webinar or like, training. Do they care? What are they going to do with it? You know, um, a case in point for me, because I brought up Barbie, here she comes again, uh, a long time ago, like a good 25 years ago. when I first was learning about instructional design techniques for virtual instructor led training. I took a class I got to design a class and I chose that I was going to teach people all about vintage Barbie and collecting it. And my initial approach as a baby trainer, baby instructional designer was, I'm going to tell you all about collecting vintage Barbie and how fun it is for me. <laughs> and a wonderful mentor at the time, her name is Dr. Nanette Miner. I'm still in touch with her today. She said, why do I care about that? It's kind of interesting that you collect her, but why would I care for me in my life? And that helped me reframe it. And I decided that you would care. Uh, I'm gonna teach the class from the perspective of if you happen to be at a thrift store or at a flea market or at an estate sale and you come across some Barbies, how can you tell which ones might make you some money on the market? If wow. you've got yourself a vintage doll versus a new doll, you know how could you differentiate that and maybe potentially be able to make some money off of it? And I taught it from that angle. And yeah, that still came from the angle of I like to collect Barbie but it gave you a reason to be more interested in it, whether or not you were ever going to collect her. Right. Love it. What about from a technical standpoint, where do you see, you know, like looking good online is kind of tricky in a lot of ways. Where could we be doing better or what can we do? What are some like simple things we can do to look good? Well, I know, I know. Well, some simple things to look good is to just look in the camera. Not that you have to deliver a monologue, you know, we're not all radio broadcasters with a script and a team around us, uh, but looking into the camera when you have a conversation, when you're responding to people and uh, making sure that the camera is eye level, you know, so that you're not too low or too high, paying attention to lighting and angling, all those things. Uh, but I was going to say that regarding the tech, it's important to look good for sure, especially in recordings and especially in large presentations. Um, but I don't personally believe that the camera is the end all be all. Ooh, love it. <laughs> okay. Not that I, I mean, I'm always on it. I'm going to be on it. If you're a trainer, presenter, you know, meeting leader, you need to be on the camera. It's the honest truth. But it is not the end all be all. It's the beginning that helps us to connect with you and helps us to build trust. But we need to be doing something. I have a mantra, Lizette. I have a mantra for all the things uh, online. And I think that regarding the technology, it plays into regarding the technology and it plays into your previous question on what are we doing wrong. And uh, the mantra goes like this, what did I just say or do that you could have said or done? 
why am I being such a boss? Like, why am I making it all about me? And how can I let you be part of this process, this meeting, uh, this learning, you know, this moment, this team, it's just so common to get online and have someone get on the camera and talk, 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 talk. And then they ask us, what do you think? Or what do you, you know, like 20 minutes later, and it's like, I was out at three minutes. If you didn't make it about me and for me within about three to five minutes, I'm sorry, I'm not really paying attention. And so we need to stop and honestly say to ourselves, what am I doing that I could let you do? What am I saying that I could let you say? And how do I involve my remote team, people that I'm connected with in this remote environment that we now live in, in more ways than the expectation that you're just so excited to sit and listen to me. Right. And it is hard to capture people's attention online. I mean, if I look at the YouTube videos, I look through, you know, it's like a couple minutes here, a couple minutes there, like, eh, eh, just because I can move on, you know, like a webinar might be something different or a training might be different, but it's hard to engage online. Because so you're just expecting that you're some kind of amazing performer or personality when, again, that's about you rather than being about the people that you're engaging with. What can, what, what can they be doing? Can they be, I mean, the classic thing for me while I'm doing a training is maybe I've got a process to introduce, but before I introduce the process, I am going to ask them what they know about it first. Right. And then I'm going to say, respond in the chat or use the annotation tools to type on the screen. Or, uh, you know, I do those, usually I do those two things first, one or the other, and then I'll have people come off of mute and share what they've already articulated. I'll have them share more or why. And now we've had a whole conversation around where you're at, what your opinions are about it. Maybe you know nothing, you know, and then when I go into introducing the process, I'm way more informed and I'm able to tailor it to the audience in front of me that day. And then I follow that up with, what are you going to do with that? Let's have an activity. Um, because again, me talking about it is one thing, <laughs> you know, so, so right. involving people first ask people first to say, what, what's happening with you? What's your perspective on this thing, you know, mm -hmm. so that they can, they can let you know, and they can be part of it. And it only makes you better at what you're doing. Right. You're listening. And also there's so much expertise in the virtual room already, and people want to share their stories. I mean, if it's meant to be interactive, then, then definitely. What about for webinars though? Those are really tough because those are those really are a one-to-many broadcast. So we've got polls and Q and A's, but it's still pretty lopsided. Is that just the way it is? Ask yourself, you know, why am I having a webinar versus just making a recording? You know, I'm having a webinar because I have a live audience. And so what's, at least that's what my answer is. So what would be the benefit of the live audience? And so I'm gonna ask questions and involve people in ways that make sense to move it forward and make it feel like it's tailored to them. I'm not gonna ask questions that would require I know the answers to, but I'm going to ask questions that will allow you to be part of it and give me more colorful responses. I guess a case in point might be like this. I've done many webinars on how do you engage in a webinar? <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> I have a long list of things I think you could do. And I've written three books on it, actually. And so, you know, I could tell you the world according to me, but, you know, how much do you care? And so what I will do is I will ask, you know, what, what do you think is the most engaging thing like that you've ever seen a presenter do? Type it in the chat. And what's going to come through primarily is stuff I already know. And right. what I'm going to be looking for and responding to is something that I haven't seen before. Somebody videotaped themselves building a snowman while they were in the webinar and that engaged you. I've never seen that before, Sally. Thank you for telling us. Everyone note that, you know, whatever it may be, I made that up. But right. I'm going to look for something that's maybe kind of unusual because I, I already know what those answers are likely to be. And I've likely prepared my presentation to address most of them. But that doesn't mean I can't tailor to the unique audience that I have that day with those types of interactions. Amazing. Amazing. Very creative. I really love it. Again, very audience focused. I think that's definitely the key. And I love that question. What is the live audience for? 
what do you need in there? Why not do it on demand or just send a recording somewhere? Indeed. And that's also a possibility, right? There's also a place for that. So yeah. And recordings can be great. You know, I don't really love watching a recording of a live session unless the person was super famous. That's different, right? Because I'm watching them in spite of all the things that may be going on. Right. I don't really want to see the tech problems in the beginning. I don't really care about your question. I wrote in my book, it's like being a fly on the wall to a party that happened last weekend. Right. I can't respond. And those aren't my questions. So a recording can be very concise. You know, let's be honest, like a one hour webinar probably doesn't need to be a full one hour. You could probably get that down to about a 12 minute recording and get what we really need. Give us the handout, <laughs> send us to a discussion board, you know? That is exactly what happened to me. I had a 40 minute talk usually with all the polls and the Q and a and the stuff that goes on some sort of thing. And then it was like 12 minutes when I put it into a webinar format. Yeah, it was really, it was confronting indeed, but uh, a it's good normal. metric, actually a good metric, like, Hey, it is interactive enough that it's uh, going back and forth more than not. All right. Well, I want to ask you uh, icebreakers. Icebreakers are a controversial topic or are becoming more and more controversial. Some people love them. Some people hate them. I always say the key to icebreakers is making them appropriate for the moment. But mm -hmm. what is your take on icebreakers? Yeah, the same thing. I think they're necessary to bring a group together if you want the group to be working together and doing things uh, and, and sharing I, I don't always do an icebreaker. If I was doing a webinar to a thousand people, do we need it? You know, they're not meeting each other anyway. So maybe I do something that's more like to help them trust me a little more. And it seems icebreakery because I've done that. But I do think that icebreakers within the context of workshops and facilitated events and team meetings are necessary, but we mess up when we don't make them connected to what we're doing. You know, we don't have any time to waste. And so we have to keep it connected to what we're doing. One of my favorite icebreakers is to pull up several images connected to whatever we may be teaching in some way or whatever we may be speaking about in some way. And then I'll ask the question, how are these images related to what we or you are doing right now? Pick one and be ready to describe. And they can enter in the chat or I can, you know, I make time so they can come off mute. Maybe they go in small groups. You know, but I'm often running train the trainer programming uh, and tomorrow I'll be doing train the instructional designer programming. And so I've got an icebreaker. They all know each other, but I'm meeting them for the first time and I want to learn more about their instructional design approaches and things. So I've got these nine images on the screen and they range from like a rocket ship to uh, the beach, to uh, some pandas, to some flowers growing. You know, they're, they're all different. They're all over the place. And the question will be, which image best describes you in your current role as instructional designer of virtual instructor-led training? I'm gonna get real specific. Wow. You know, and then I'm gonna ask them, so you are the panda right now. Why, you know, if they say that and someone might say, or there's one with balloons. Um, a lot of leaders will pick the one with the balloons, the, the ones that you fly in, not the ones you hold, <laughs> hot air <laughs> balloons. And they'll say, I'm just observing from above right now, watching what's happening, floating through. You know what I'm saying? This is very interesting. People who pick the pandas, they're like, well, I'm just sitting here chilling. I'm going to take a bite. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed, but I'm happy. <laughs> you know? Right. So they start to relate wow. to what they're doing. And it's giving insight. And then, you know, a meta objective with that activity, besides them having fun and laughing with each other, the meta objective is, coming off of uh, using the annotation tool to type your name on the image, coming off of mute, communicating in a way that might be a little bit awkward, uh, the rest of us listening, paying attention. Those types of things are going on at the same time. And so highly effective and very important for my objectives in getting to know them and to help them communicate more effectively while we are together. Right. And you not standing there going, okay, if you'd like to unmute, do this. And then if you'd like to do this, do like just going through housekeeping list where nobody wants to unmute, nobody's going to like to unmute and interrupt you. Sorry. Right. 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 Say interrupt me all you want. Nobody ever does it. It's also my experience. You're right. You're right. So you're kind of doing all the tech checks and the 
small training, like, okay, you've done this now on the whiteboard or whatever it is. And, you know, so now you're not afraid to do the next thing because it's not overwhelming. So you're kind of slowly training and gaining information. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Use the icebreaker to confirm the usage of the tools. Um, It used to be that we'd have to teach them the tools. People pretty much know them today. They may not know annotation, but they're better at using them today. But you're you're right. confirming or you're teaching, you're identifying the gaps because we do have to teach how to be in the environment. And maybe they know how to be in the environment, but uh, they don't necessarily know how to be in the environment with me in that moment. And I always like to teach the tool in the moment of need so that we can apply it because you're going to promptly forget it if you're not using it. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, right. So never, my, my tip was always, First show, then send the link, right? (laughs) Like, otherwise they're clicking the link. You're so right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, or in they're playing around and they're totally not listening to instruction. I was like, I'm going to first show it and then I will send the link and then we can all play around for a bit. So so, so there's that. I love that. Okay. So in terms of though, now uh, we've done a lot of tips and in the last um, sort of uh, part of our time together, I want to talk, you've also worked on virtual teams. So I'd like to dive into sort of your experiences. Now I find out you, you mentioned before you worked at Webex earlier and that the ironic part was that you worked at the office at Webex. So that is very ironic given that they're a video conferencing tool. What was the reasoning behind that? And how was it talked about at Webex at the time? If I may ask, I don't know if that's, for sure. I didn't prepare well, you for that. It was the nineties. It was the late nineties. So, you know, that's what everyone was doing. It was, I lived in California at the time I was working in the Silicon Valley. So I did work for WebEx for six years, and it was the first two years where I worked in the office and commuted an hour and a half each way. Uh, Then they moved offices from San Jose, California to uh, Sacramento, California. And I lived in San Francisco right in the middle, and I was uh, permitted to work from home at that point. Uh, Yet the rest of the team in SAC, they ended up still in the office. Uh, So I think, you know what, it's the same reasons that we have today that people were working in the office. Uh, leadership has come up in that world, and that is how they know how to build relationships, uh, to establish trust, and to get people to be collaborative. And though we have the technology to allow people to be, uh, you know, remotely accessing one another, we still need to build the people skills to use that technology. We need to trust that those people skills can work over the long haul. We're doing better at it today. We're still not 100% there, and we definitely weren't there in the 90s. The tool, the features were way too new. The tools were way too new. And so that's the primary clunky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Talking about the webcam, it's funny. We we used to turn on the webcam just to say hi, but the the goal among the training team was always turn that thing off because it's going to break if you don't. Ha, right. There's not enough bandwidth to manage all the... (laughs) (laughs) So you were training no camera just voice and screen sharing only at the time? Uh, well, we uh, well because I worked at WebEx, we could upload files into the environment and move through. So there was that and there was screen sharing too. And because I was teaching the product, I'm teaching all the features. But our practice was to come on camera to say hello, but then we would turn off the camera to get to business. And in fact, um, in the first edition of Interact and Engage in 2014, I wrote um, only use the webcam when it's connected directly to the objective. You know, otherwise, why are you sitting there on the camera wasting bandwidth and distracting everyone? Uh, you'll see in, if you look at it, if you were to, if anyone was ever to compare it, I rewrote that entire section uh, this last year because obviously being on camera is the main thing nowadays. For people to be good at, I don't believe that it is the main thing for what you're intending ultimately, but I do think it's a very big deal. And if you want anyone to trust you, you need to be on that camera. Indeed, indeed. And uh, what were some of the things that then uh, on the other remote teams that you worked on, what were some of the things that you all struggled with? I don't know how long ago this was, so I don't know how to direct the question specifically. Oh, yeah, sure. No, I started working. uh, Well, I have been remote for almost 25 years on three different teams. But when I worked at Dale Carnegie, I was also in the office for the first little bit. But then we ended up not being in the office at all because it wasn't working. We were finding that the people that we wanted to hire to uh, build the team and to grow the team and the product were not located uh, where we were in that geographical region. And so, of course, we needed to be remote. And then I became remote pretty quickly, too. Uh, But I think that the thing that we were most challenged by 
if I look at just our remote team and the people that were working on it, it was about establishing the culture of being remote. And I think that the biggest thing that we did to build that culture and then to continue to seed that culture was to have an ongoing chat. And at the time, it's kind of like before Slack days, Slack kind of came along when like, I don't know, this was 2011, but we were just using um, Skype instant messenger and we would have all the groups, which then, you know, now you have Microsoft Teams and Slack and all the wonderful tools. Um, but then that was a, a really wonderful tool and we would create the main team and it became a process as part of the culture to just say hello in the morning, like you would when you would walk into an office. And you replied if you could, but if you were in a meeting, that was okay that you didn't immediately reply. And so I remember over time, we actually developed a document that outlined the culture of how we were to chat with each other. And when we brought new people on the team, we had to teach them, this is how we chat and what we expect of it. And it may not be what people would expect because like I said, it wasn't like you had to be in it all the time. Right. We very much made it be like when you're in an office and you walk in, it's normal to non-verbally wave to someone or at least, you know, maybe make eye contact. And so we, we use the chat in that same way. So it wasn't like so-and-so didn't say hello back. <laughs> we would never do that. But if people were, you know, headed out or headed in, we just say good morning, you know, good evening. And we all had different schedules and different things that we worked it out. But I think that was the big thing, like just sort of establishing the culture. And then to just follow on with that very quickly, there were many, many people around those offices who still worked in the office and had always done that. We were a new team, a new division that came in. And so we had the clash between, you know, what, what had always been done and what was being done. And so even though we might've been strong as a remote team, we had the people in the offices that didn't understand us and didn't know how to connect with us. Right. Right. A true hybrid team and sort of the worst kind in a way, because you had a real separate remote, you know, uh, satellite and then a core in-person team. Right. Well, and they weren't even on our team. So we're talking like that's like that was HR. That was, you know, oh. other departments. So we were we were a team and our team itself was hybrid. Some people working in offices, but our team was so driven to the remote product that we were building and supporting and offering that we had already bought into that culture and we were building it. But you had people who weren't involved with that product at all, who'd been at the company. Dell Carnegie's over a hundred years old, right? So there, there was a lot of um, just sort of traditional things happening in the office and they didn't understand. So I love it. Yeah. You sort of, of I can imagine, I mean, I can imagine sort of the uh, the remote culture clash that that created as you're using Skype as a sort of virtual office, as a way of creating presence with each other while right. not having video or any of the fancy sort of tools that we have today. Indeed, I used to use the Skype status to convey to my colleagues where I was because I was second line support. So they had to know where I was, you know, in case they had to like, yeah, yeah, it was a, yeah, it totally worked. You know, it was really fun. So, uh, yeah, so interesting. So in our last couple of minutes here, oh man, I have so many questions, but okay, I've got to, we're going to take it down. We're going to bring it back down. I do have a question about online meetings. So one of the big things is people say that they're having way too many meetings now, of course, because we've taken what we did in person, we've translated it online and it just ends up in endless back-to-back -back meetings. So I guess the one question I would have is like, people can, are, you know, are there techniques for reducing meetings? I don't know if that's in your area of expertise, but also what are some of the things that people can do to improve the quality of the meetings that they're currently having? Yeah, I wish I had the answer on that first one. I think that, you know, online did not help the, the plight of too many meetings. If anything, it made it worse because it's just even that much easier to be in back-to-back -back ones. You're literally not walking down the hall so you can click the link, right? <laughs> so yeah. challenge. But I do think that uh, when we're running meetings, again, you have people that are leading them and we put all the work on one person and say, you know what, develop the agenda around the meeting and the rest of us are just sitting there, not involved. So it's the same. What am I doing or saying that you could be doing and saying? And why are we having this meeting? And we're coming together as live people in this moment. You know, why are we doing that? And so it should be a better outcome. 
than if we were to work differently to this outcome. I, th I think that the 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 advice is the same. Uh, <laughs> I'll often when I'm coaching trainers or meeting leaders, presenters, I'll say, why are you working so hard? You're reading all the slides. You're reading all the chats. You're, you're, <laughs> you're reading all the answers in the poll. When are you going to stop and let us talk about it and let us consider it and let us work through it? Why are you working it. so hard? Yeah. Well, and I think you actually answered the first question with the the other, the second answer, which is why are we coming together synchronously? Like that is the that is the question to be asking before we schedule a meeting to begin with. Is like, do we really need this, or is there some better way? Like brainstorming, we could do that. Like my brainstorming comes best when I'm out running. Like I just want to think about things for a while. I'm constantly like writing things, stopping and writing things on my phone. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, keeping and going. My, my running speeds are so slow, but I'm taking notes because I'm thinking. No, but I love that. Love that. Okay. Last thing, <laughs> last two things. So uh, the, the first thing is advice for people who are just maybe dipping their toes into doing virtual trainings or webinars or presentations. They haven't done it before, but after hearing this podcast and getting your book, they're ready to, to dive in. What would you advise that they do? I think they need to get comfortable with the technology because the technology will get in the way of what you're trying to do. You know, if you're nervous about how you look on camera, if you're nervous about reading chat, you got to get more comfortable with the tech. And uh, I'd happily invite you to join, I run a, uh, we call it the Virtual Training Heroes Hangout. Uh, the last Friday of every month uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern time for 45 minutes, people that are interested in virtual training webinars and meetings from all around the globe gather together and uh, I will choose a topic and present for just a few minutes in the beginning, but then we break out and network with one another and just share ideas. And we have an ongoing community. And so it'd be a great place for somebody who's new to come in and just check out what people are doing. Um, I, I, I drop us right into, you'll be in breakouts, you'll be chatting, you'll be doing all the things. <laughs> so This will not be a boring webinar. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more of a gathering of a community of like-minded people who want to get better at this. Um, but, you know, just having fun with it too, you know, like a way that I taught myself way back when, uh, my kid is 20 now and I was working at WebEx way back then. And I remember you know, I would never just call my mom. I would be like, mom, get into the WebEx. I got to show you the growing tummy, <laughs> you know? And like, right. My mom and I both were doodlers on the phone in the past. And so we would get into a WebEx together and I'd pull up a whiteboard. And while we're talking, uh, we're doodling on a whiteboard. So using the tools in ways that are just more, or maybe we could say less pressure and more, quote, you know, casual and normal in the daily routine of life. Love it. I love it. And uh, I like the tip of getting comfortable with the tech because the smooth things will always go wrong. Even if you've double and triple checked, things go wrong. So it's good to just understand how everything works so that you can know when and if to fix it. Sometimes you just move on, right? Sometimes it's like, I have no idea. I mean, We're going to move I on. Mean, <laughs> I have another principle. That first one, the mantra is like principle number one. Principle number two, though, highly connected to it. Learn the tech, use the heck out of the tech, get over the tech. I <laughs> love it, right? Get over the tech, indeed. <laughs> get over it. It's like, remember when we first got cell phones, you know, 100,000 years ago? You know, I remember, <laughs> mom, I just got my phone. How do I sound? Great, honey. Do you have anything that you need? No, I just call on you because I got a new phone. So, right. <laughs> you know, I got to get over it. It's not like that now. These things are attached to us today. So you, you have to sort of treat the Zooms and the Teams and the WebExes like that where you're not really thinking about how we are here. You know, imagine that if you were in a, in a conference room and you were thinking about how to be in the conference room. Yeah, that is odd. Indeed. Indeed. And we had to learn it a long time ago, Brilliant. but you're not thinking about it anymore. And when you learned it, maybe you didn't even realize you learned it, but you're not thinking about how we're using the table, how we're using the chair. You might be fumbling with the darn projectors. That thing will never go. <laughs> Right. That stays even now. <laughs> you didn't have to teach anyone how to walk through the door and select their seat. You know what I mean? But online, we do have to do that. So if you kind of get past that, you have to guide your audience through that level of comfort. It goes back to that icebreaker thing. And then you can get to the topic at hand or the purpose at hand. Love it. 
Love it. And being purposeful about why we're there synchronously. Everybody's time is valuable. We're all tired and being online too much doesn't help. So good to get enough rest there. All right. Last question, a super easy one. Cassie, if people want your book and they want to know more, or connect with you, where can they find you? What's the best place to go online? I think the best place is to check out CassieConsulting.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn under Cassie Labori. Great. I'll put all of that in the show notes. I took copious notes, really copious notes. And so the show notes will be nice and rich for our audience. Thank you so much for sharing your story and all those valuable tips today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a complete joy. All right, everybody. Until next time, be powerful. <laughs>